This what you are seeing is a question paper of MBBS first professional exam of MBBS 2019 admitted batch. This question paper is of anatomy paper 1 and this exam was conducted by H. NBGU that is Hemwati Nandan Bahuguna University of Uttarakhand and within this university this is there are three government medical colleges affiliated one is GMC Haldwani then government Doon Medical College Dehradun and government medical college Srinagar also so this exam was conducted on 5th of February, 5th of February 2021. So this what you are seeing is anatomy paper 1 and this was having, this was of 100 marks and here it was section A which is of 20 marks. So 20 questions, MCQs, 20 marks and I am going to solve all these MCQs for you all to check your answers and for the up coming new batches they can learn from this okay so let's start solving so starting with question number one which of the following nerve leads to apthem deformity ulnar nerve radial nerve median nerve axillary nerve so you must be knowing it is an easy question that compression of median nerve at the wrist below the flexor retinaculum in the carpal tunnel leads to ape thumb deformity. So, so remember if you're talking about median nerve, median nerve, if there are two types of injuries mainly asked, one is supracondylar. Supracondylar is above the elbow, above the elbow. Basically, it generally happens mostly because of the fracture of uh, humerus above the condyles, supracondylar fracture. So, in such case, what happens is there will be deformity called hand of benediction. Hand of benediction or some authors might write it as pointing index pointing index finger so these two I mean this deformity is because of supracondylar fracture of humerus when there is compression of median nerve above the elbow now other one is compression of median nerve at the wrist that is the example which is being asked above and there you know is you know ape thumb deformity this can be written as ape like hand also and because the main thing is there will be flattening of the thinar eminence in this okay now for, because this is for your revision purpose so now I'll talk about ulnar nerve ulnar nerve ulnar nerve basically again the two types of uh, compression that is asked one is in the cubital tunnel and other is in the Queens canal Queens canal so in cubital tunnel means compression of ulnar nerve behind the medial epicondyle of humerus <coughs> there where it's you know covered by a fascial uh, band and that's called cubital tunnel so if ulnar nerve gets compressed here of course there will be no, no, partial claw hand. Take now compression of uh, with, of course, there will be a lot of sensory loss also. But what I'm talking here is only of the deformity. Ulnar nerve compression in Guyens canal, what will lead to again partial claw hand. But there will be both, you know, trophic and sensory loss 
in both the thing and that you'll have to compare because some in in this there will be more of sensory loss and basically you know uh, the trophic changes also will be more in this but what happens is basically while compression here at the cubital tunnel there will be extra muscles here you know in Guin's canal which compressed there are like 15 muscles that are paralyzed those are the intrinsic muscles of the hand but here you know uh, uh, why partial claw hand because first and second lumbricals well by median nerve so there will be less of clawing then in cubital tunnel basically what happens is this flexor carpi ulnaris and the medial two tendons of this uh, flexor digitorum profundus that they, they are also paralyzed so so the clawing will actually be much relieved on the ring and in, uh, in uh, ring and the little finger and first and second you know this index and middle finger they are already a little bit relieved because of the uh, you know integrity of the median nerve so in those if you compare these two partial claw hand you will find that this person will be having a better life to live got it if this person is getting a better life better life to live although the nerve injury is proximal right See if nerve normally the convention is whenever a nerve is injured proximally the more the nerve injured proximal to its origin there is more disastrous injury the more of motor more of sensory more of trophic changes but here what is happening is because of the you know proximal injury the person gets a better life to live and that is called ulnar paradox okay now talking about radial nerve injury radial nerve injury if it's in the radial groove radial groove what the what you call it as crutch paralysis or saturday night palsy so don't get confused people generally get confused with crutch paralysis, paralysis thinking it to be axillary nerve because of this compression of radial nerve in the radial groove you know you call it as crutch paralysis or saturday night palsy here of course there will be wrist drop deformity will be wrist drop but remember there will be you know not only uh, deformity will be the wrist but also there will be loss of extension at the elbow also the, the main muscle that is triceps right so triceps you know the uh, there's a medial head of triceps there's a long head you know lateral head medial head so lateral head and the medial head of triceps they innovated there in the radial groove and even that unconious also so these three additional muscles will be you know paralyzed here so there will be weakness in extension at the elbow as well now another they ask is uh, injury of radial nerve at the uh, uh, elbow or above the elbow above the elbow or at the elbow you just have to confirm like where they are talking about the injury what here i mean is like before the radial nerve terminally divides into its superficial and deep branches right that is just at the level of above to the lateral uh, epicondyle right so the last muscle remember the last muscle that the radial nerve innervates is extensor carpi radialis longus and soon after that this radial nerve divides into its superficial and deep branches superficial branch you know that continues as one of the content of the roof of the cubital fossa and supplies the it becomes a cutaneous nerve right then what about this uh, deep branch the deep branch the first muscle that it innervates is extensor carpi radialis longus and then it you know supplies this um, brachial radialis uh, you know and it's no brachioridal has also been already been supplied by the main trunk brachioridalis and extensor carpi radialis longus by the main trunk but extensor carpi radialis long uh, brevis and the common extensor origin 
on the posterior aspect of the lateral epicondyle of humerus. So all the muscles including supinator they are supplied by the deep branch of radial nerve. So above the elbow the purpose of asking is like you know apart from wrist drop of course wrist drop will be here also but there will be sensory loss remember sensory loss on the dorsum of back of hand uh, that will be included here also in crutch and saturday night and even in this uh, injury above the elbow and the next is remember it's important ra radial nerve injury in the back of forearm right when we talk about back of forearm we actually talking is about the deep branch of radial nerve and that is also called as posterior interosseous nerve of forearm so here not to remember basically you can better call it as because this might be a refined type of mcq they might give two options wrist drop and uh, wrist drop and finger drop So finger drop will be the better word when we talk about injury of the posterior interosseous nerve or deep branch of radial nerve in the back of forearm because the you know the deep branch of radial nerve has already supplied the common extensors at the origin of you know uh, behind the little little condyle of humerus they all you know this injury is happening at the mid of the back of forearm so there's uh, you know this extensor digitorum actually is innervated uh, many by many twigs into the back of forearm along its course so there are only chances that this extensor digitorum as well as the deep muscles of this you know the thumb you know abductor pollicis longus extensor pollicis longus extensor pollicis brevis and extensor indices they're going to be paralyzed when there is injury here at the deep uh, the, at the back of forearm so there will be finger drops that will be a better answer okay now next nerve here is axillary nerve now axillary nerve axillary nerve what will it lead to basically the one important thing there will be flattening of shoulder contour flattening of deltoid eminence or you can say shoulder contour or better word is deltoid eminence deltoid eminence there will be flattening of course there will be in a loss of abduction okay so there will be loss of abduction initial you know or up till 90 degrees 15 to 90 degrees loss of abduction okay and of course you know this upper lateral cutaneous nerve of arm that is supplying the regimental area regimental area all there will be sensory loss on the lower half of the deltoid where you give intramuscular injections so all this is what you'll find is there will be an injury of axillary nerve in the posterior surgical neck of the humerus so that was about this axillary nerve now i will talk about the next question here is which nerve is felt behind the medial epicondyle of humerus i think i just told you that this nerve if you seeing this way right so ulnar nerve actually when it travels down behind the medial epicondyle like this and behind it is like you know a band of fascia which covers this ulnar nerve from behind so that it gets compartmentalized 
behind the mere lepicunda so this is the right humerus anterior view so this compartment what you are seeing here it's called cubital tunnel cubital tunnel got it so which nerve is felt behind the medial epicondyle of humerus of course the answer will be ulnar nerve no another the question related to is similar question that what are the nerves in intimate relation to the humerus so remember in, in intimate relation to the humerus they ask is this is the anterior view of the right humerus so axillary nerve winds behind the surgical neck of the humerus right so axillary nerve is a one another nerve that is in intimate relation to this humerus axillary nerve and radial nerve i have already taught you that the radial nerve passes through the radial groove like this so this is the radial groove on the posterior aspect through which this radial nerve is passing so the third nerve that is in intimate relation is radial nerve with humerus so what it is not in re re uh, relation to humerus in the arm so remember the two nerves that not in relation with humerus one is musculocutaneous musculocutaneous nerve and median nerve these two nerves are not in intimate relation to humerus in the arm okay so answer uh, two question two answer is ulnar nerve question number 3 lateral boundary of cubital fossa is formed by which muscle so you know this if i am talking is about the right cubital fossa this is right cubital fossa seen from anterior view anterior view so this is a triangle where you find this as the transverse crease of the elbow joint this is the transverse crease of the elbow joint this is the lateral border formed by the medial boundary of which muscle which muscle is this this is this muscle is brachioradialis and which muscle is this this is medial boundary is formed by the lateral border of pronator teres right so this is the cubital fossa so lateral boundary of cubital fossa is formed by which muscle here you have seen the answer that is brachioradialis next question is posterior wall of axilla is formed by all the muscles except so axilla fast revision remember here you have this you know axilla let's say and here you have is a clavicle right you have a clavicle here and then you have this muscle pectoralis major attached to here this is pectoralis major posteriorly like you know you have this subscapularis in the upper i mean to make it more uh, relevant i think there was one question asked uh, regarding the boundary so remember posterior boundary of axilla is more dipping down while anterior boundary anterior boundary of axilla is higher up so this symmetry if you also keep remembering the small small little points this might become options in mcqs later on so posteriorly the upper two third is by this is subscapularis sorry yes subscapularis is this muscle then you have is this muscle in the posterior one third lower portion this is by teres major right and here anteriorly boundary is formed by pectoralis major 
major although there is this muscle here in between this is pectoralis minor pectoralis minor that also is forming the anterior wall but it is a deep muscle covered by pectoralis major and what lastly what you find below here is a tendinous fold of this muscle that is latissimus dorsi <clears throat> and this is clavi pectoral fascia which invests this muscle pectoralis minor and then dips down as the you know there was a question asked one time that what is this tendon of axilla like suspend you know this is said to, said to be suspensory ligament actually suspends this floor of the axilla it you know when you initiate abduction the initial 15 degrees of abduction there is elevation of this dome of the floor of the axilla and that's because of this uh, you know tendon or ligament of the suspensory ligament of the axilla so this is clavi pectoral fascia and it invests this muscle and don't forget there's one muscle missing down here and that muscle is you know and in on the inferior surface the clavicle middle one third and that also is like invested by this fascia and this is subscap first subclavius muscle subclavius right actually speaking the cavity of axilla if they ask not cavity of axilla is this cavity this is the cavity of axilla right so your question is here posterior wall of the axilla is formed by all the muscles except of course there is minor will be the answer because it is a muscle of rotator cuff and not in the contents of the posterior wall of axilla okay then question number four question number five rotator cuff is formed by all except uh, now rotator cuff you know uh, rotator cuff is actually let's say this is humerus and this is glenoid fossa of the scapula and rotator cuff muscles here anteriorly this this is the right sided transfer section of the shoulder joint so you have s s i t so this is the view you are seeing is superior view of the transfer section of right shoulder joint so this is subscapularis and this is supra spinatus this is sorry this is infra spinatus and this is teres minor okay <clears throat> i hope you know the nerve supply of all these muscles subscapularis fast revision what is the nerve sub nerve to subclavius nerve to subscapularis upper and lower nerve to subscapularis branch from posterior division of form the posterior cord of brachial plexus supraspinatus infraspinatus nerve supply will be yes suprascapular nerve teres minor will be from the branch of axillary nerve and remember nerve to teres minor has a pseudo ganglion also okay so rotator cuff is from the all except the teres major will be the answer because you know it's a it not contributes this rather it's a content of the posterior wall of axilla okay what type of joint is superior radio ulnar joint so superior radio ulnar joint remember is a pivotal variety of joint okay it it causes supi, you know um, rotatory movements along the longitudinal axis for supination and pronation so another example of pivotal joint is of course you know is atlanto axial joint this is another example of pivotal joint so remember the two joints i have told you is about one is superior radial joint and atlanto axial joint 
now talking about uh, this saddle joint let's first cover up the examples saddle joint you know the examples of is sterno clavicular is one example then <clears throat> patellofemoral patellofemoral is one example then calcaneo cuboid calcaneo cuboid is one example then of course the most important saddle joint example is between the first uh, metacarpal and uh, carpal first carpo metacarpal joint and the carpal bone here is this is also very important to remember that it is trapezium trapezium and first metacarpal that also is saddle joint and another example here is that is incudomalleolar incudo malleolar between malleus and incus so these are five major examples of saddle joint now let's cover the examples of plane joint the plane joints are most of this uh, inter carpal joint right inter metacarpal joint similarly you have intertarsal right intertarsal joints inter metatarsal joints right so these are the uh, and lot a lot many other joints like you know superior tibio fibular joint <sighs> So those are actually this provides just sliding gliding movements. So plane so you know, plane joints are these joints and hinge joint. That, that let me tell you there are a lot much variety of plane synovial joints. So there will be that will be a big list. So I've given you just major major examples. Now hinge joint. Hinge joint. Examples of hinge joint. So hinge joint, remember. Actually, it provides movement in a single plane. Important point is hinges. It provides movement in a single plane, and that will be flexion and extension, right? Or might be adduction, abduction, whatever. Only two movement possible in a single plane. So that is a hinge joint. So best example, you know, is elbow joint. Best example is elbow joint. That is an example of hinge joint. The second is ankle joint. Ankle joint is also called tibiotalar joint. Then the third one is IP joints, interphalangeal joints of, you know, the digits of the hand and of the toes, you know. So that is a few examples of hinge joint. So I believe this is helping you for your revision, for preparation for your exams further. Now question number seven is total number of spinal segments. Total number of spinal segments, of course, the answer is 31 spinal segments and 31, 31 spinal nerves you have. And by the way, what was the answer? Yes, I have ticked the answer here. No doubt. It's done. Pivotal joint was the answer for superior ulnar joint. Then... Total number of spinal segments is so spinal segments is equal to number of spinal nerves. So let's revise how many spinal nerves we have. Remember, we have spinal nerves or or spinal segments is the same thing, right? And here we'll talk about the vertebrae, right? So remember that we have uh, seven cervical vertebrae. And eight cervical nerves. Then you have twelve thoracics, twelve thoracic vertebrae, and twelve thoracic nerves. Then you have five lumbar vertebrae, and you have five lumbar spinal nerves. You have uh, five sacral sacral vertebrae. You have five sacral spinal nerves 
you have four coccygeal vertebrae and you have one coccygeal nerve so let's first count them so when you count them you will find that vertebrae is 33 in number and spinal nerves or spinal segment is 31 in number so remember this and by the way uh, you know in the same sequence let me tell you if they ask like from where do these spinal nerves arise so only in this you know one two uh, i think you should, i should write it here only one two seven cervical nerves cervical nerves they arise from you remember these seven nerves first seven nerves they arise from above their corresponding vertebral right <sighs> above the corresponding vertebrae c8 of course will pass below c7 vertebrae or above t1 so from now remember that this much portion t1 to first coccygeal all the spinal nerves from t1 and down below they will pass below their corresponding vertebrae okay so and this pattern is changing because of the eighth cervical nerve okay so the total number of spinal segments is 31 okay so it's done question number eight part of brain which undergoes de degenerative changes in parkinsonism it's a very very common thing you know it's because of the degenerating of the you know this dopaminergic neurons in this substance in niagara right so degeneration happens here is in the substantia niagara of the midbrain parkinsonism question number nine which muscle divides the submandibular gland into superficial and deep parts now look here if you have look, we're talking is about this gland a j-shaped gland and this gland is some mandibular gland and what they have asked is the muscle which actually indents or divides this gland into superficial and deep parts so question is that which muscle is this check this you know is superficial part remember this is important and this is a deep part but what important here is it remember that superficial part they might twist this mcq sometime again so remember that superficial part is larger and the deeper part is smaller one thing now this muscle let me answer it and here you know that it is mylohyoid is the correct answer so this is mylohyoid mylohyoid muscle but not to just leave this because this one more muscle, uh, similar gland and that also is like you know comparable it might be a question next time so remember now what i'm drawing is another j-shaped gland another j-shaped gland and this gland is also indented by a muscle the question might be uh, the next time sometime again that which muscle actually indents this gland what gland is this this is lacrimal gland lacrimal gland so you have to answer that which muscle indents the lacrimal gland and this was submandibular gland salivary gland 
So answer me fast. Of course, if you cannot answer, let me tell you now because there is a similar question. So the muscle which indents uh, lacrimal gland is LPS, levator palpebri superioris. Now another more important thing to remember here is that unlike the submandibular gland, the superficial part, that's why I make you reminded it, the superficial part is larger and the smaller part is the deep part. Here what is there, that superficial part, superficial is the smaller part, a small, smaller portion of the gland and it is also called as palpebral, palpebral portion of this lacrimal gland. While this is the deeper portion, deeper portion is large. Unlike some mandibular gland, this is large and it is also called as orbital, orbital portion of lacrimal gland, which is larger and deeper inside. So, and these, there are ducts like, you know, passing from deep to superficial gland, passing through this. This is important clinically also. Because excision and removal of the deep gland leads to, like, you know, the uh, no loss of secretions then. Okay, so that was about lacrimal and some mandibular. It was comparative. So, I have told you about both the glands. Hormones. Kya hai ye? Horner syndrome. Sorry. Horner syndrome produces all symptoms except. No, Horner's syndrome Horner syndrome is actually loss of sympathetic innervation in the contents of the eyeball so remember Horner syndrome leads to one is ptosis partial partial ptosis one thing then is meiosis and third one is anhydrosis and fourth one is N. F. Thalmos. Of Thalmos. And fifth is loss of cilio. Spinal reflex. And this is not, I mean, you know, this is um, found in lower animals. So, and this is all happening because of loss of sympathetic innervation. Partial ptosis is because of loss of uh, sympathetic innervation to Muller's muscle. That is the smooth muscle component of LPS. Meiosis is because of loss of uh, innervation of dilator pupillae. And anhydrosis is of course because of loss of uh, sympathetic innervation to the glands there in this uh, surrounding the orbits. Then, uh, don't confuse with, you know, lacrimal gland. Lacrimal gland is parasympathetically innervated for secretion. And NF, basically we're talking is about the mucosal secretions there, right? And NF thalmos is like sinking of, sinking back of the eyeball. That is because of the loss of innervation to this muscle orbitalis and orbitalis is the muscle which bridges the inferior vital fissure in the floor of the orbits and that was one reason which is like maintaining the anterior posterior axis of the eyeball uh, of course you have this retrobulbar fat also in the apex of the orbits but when there is paralysis of orbitalis there is like sinking back of the eyeballs. So, N of thalmos is also reserved there. And loss of celiac spinal reflex, this haps, happens in the uh, lower animals. Right? Like pinching behind the nape of neck, there is like squeezing and, you know, of uh, clinging of the eyelids and all. So, that is not found in humans, basically. Now, Horner syndrome, what is not uh, all produced, only, except they have asked. So, I believe you can see the answer that X F thalmos is not seen in Horner syndrome. So, answer will be 10 D. Question number 11. Which one is not a component of carotid sheath? Now, this also is very important question. 
ऑप्शन हेयर आर इंटरनल कैरोटेड आर्टरी वेगस नर्व सिंपेथेटिक टंग इंटरनल जुगुलर वेन आई बिलीव नो बाय नो यू मस्ट हैव आंसर इट यू मे सब गेस्ट दी आंसर नो लेट मी रिवाइज दिस फॉर यू यू नो देर इज लाइक यू नो यू हैव दिस कैरोटिड यू नो कॉमन कैरोटिड कॉमन कैरोटिड कंटिन्यूंग एस you know this is external carotid common carotid this is common carotid artery this is internal carotid artery and you have is you know internal jugular vein ijv internal jugular vein internal jugular vein by the way don't confuse you because keep adding to your mind that this is going to communicate subclavian and this will join the brachiocephalic vein similarly here what will happen is that this artery uh, you know this is common carotid common carotid will actually join the subclavian subclavian artery and will form the brachiocephalic trunk on the right side or maybe on the left side there will be the direct branches from the arch porta what i am trying to make you understand is the you know a vertical extent of carotid sheath so this remember that this is going to pass into this carotid canal present in the floor of the pectoral temporal bone this is carotid canal and this uh, you know this is carotid canal and there you have is the jugular foramen jugular foramen is behind this pectoral temporal in the posterior cranial fossa and you know that there are three cranial nerves arising from jugular foramen apart from this internal jugular vein and you do have a sympathetic plexus surrounding this common carotid internal carotid artery as well so i'm listing all the things which might come in your exam maybe twisting your questions even in your neat pgs so this uh, you know they will pass out like this 9th uh, 10th 11th all these cranial nerves will be passing out like this okay and important is that you remember one thing very important that what about the lymphatic drainage so remember uh, there is this right lymphatic right lymphatic duct that drains into this junction of subclavian vein and interjugular vein on the right side similarly there will be i have just for your imagination i'm drawing it that here on the left side here on the left side it is thoracic duct right and either yahan pe it's right lymphatic duct okay so you can imagine that here it is internal jugular and it is subclavian and here it is any and by the way where every i mean till now you must have learned that this thoracic duct is a content of the neck on the left side and it actually arches here at the level of c7 transverse process of c7 it's here it arches right so now let's wind up all thinking about what all can be the contents of carotid sheath so down below this carotid sheath will reach to this uh, brachiocephalic artery on the right side on reaching to the arch of aorta on the left side and even to the uh, you know uh, you know where this subclavian meets interjugular vein so all this is like you know contents of carotid sheath so now you can list the list them all contents of carotid sheath will be i am listing it here uh, contents 
contents of carotid sheet they will be internal jugular vein common carotid artery internal carotid artery this you must be knowing by now then there will be ninth ninth tenth and eleventh cranial now at its upper end and you will have thoracic duct or right lymphatic duct at its lower end apart from that you might find some lymphatics and don't forget yes sympathetic sympathetic plexus that also you can see is around the internal carotid and common carotid few lymph nodes might be also present there got it now so this is all the contents of carotid sheet now talking about the relations basically this also is important if this was the carotid sheet and here you are having that you know common carotid i mean internal carotid or common carotid and you have internal jugular vein and you have is vagus also inside right because vagus will be like continuing down the entire length so the three contents which you'll find the entire length here now relations actually you know sympathetic trunk lies blended behind to this common carotid this is sympathetic trunk or chain you can say sympathetic chain lies behind and on to its anterior surface on outside you find is ansa ansa cervicalis right so to remember this the relation of ansa cervicalis remember a for ansa a for ansa a for anterior among if you get confused like you know sympathetic and ansa cervicalis what lies anterior so ansa cervicalis a for anterior a for ansa so this is about the contents and relations of carotid sheath so now check the answer which are not the content of carotid sheath of course sympathetic trunk is not a content of carotid sheath now talking about internal vertebral kya hai intervertebral foramen contains all except no intervertebral foramen end of nerve roots nerve trunk sympathetic ganglion spinal artery so here i'm drawing is uh, let's say this is vertebral body okay leave this i should take another space like this is the vertebral body these are the pedicles transverse process spinal process and the transverse process and here you finding is the vertebral canal this is the body of vertebrae right so you seeing it from above now you know when you place vertebra one above the another it is here at the pedicles you find is the intervertebral foramen or if you seeing let's say if you see in in this view in a lateral view you know this is the body of vertebrae so you have this notch here right this is the notch in this transverse process and you have a superior inter uh, vertebral notch and an inferior vertebral notch so and these are the you know superior and inferior articular facets and there will be the spine so each vertebrae the lower in, uh, intervertebral notch is deep while the superficial one is narrow or shallow so now look here this will be another here another vertebrae here it will be the superior notch intervertebral the lower notch will be the deeper one and these are transverse process and the, and there will be like you know posterior articular elements there so what i'm focused here about we talking is about this thing intervertebral foramen got it so now basically in the question is uh, intervertebral foramen contains all except so here you seeing is the spinal cord right you find is the spinal cord here and we have this spinal cord with the central canal and all everything 
so remember there were two dorsal nerve root and a ventral nerve root so both these nerves actually join to form the nerve trunk here only in the intervertebral foramen and it is the nerve trunk that emerges out it it is the nerve trunk what emerges out from the uh, intervertebral foramen is the spinal nerve trunk that emerges out from the intervertebral foramen <coughs> okay so what will be the content of intervertebral foramen actually you are seeing i mean you know i think i should use a little different pen to mark them out uh, these are the nerve roots which you'll find here then don't forget that the dorsal nerve root has a very important thing here and that is drg and the two nerve roots then join to form the spinal trunk which also is commencing here in the intervertebral foramen so one two and three one is spinal nerve roots ends here of course they will you know, arise from the spinal cord and will be you know they'll be present here in the uh, vertebral canal as well as in the intervertebral foramen spinal nerve roots then the other thing you find is number two is drg that is a sensory ganglion it is dorsal uh, root ganglion drg which is a sensory ganglion it is a sensory ganglion then you have the commencement of spinal number three is uh, nerve trunk spinal nerve trunk okay nerve roots actually end here in thick they actually arising from this spinal cord in the vertebral canal now apart from this of course there is need to know the vascular supply the nerve and rt and veins of course they will also enter the intervertebral canal so this is spinal artery so spinal artery will also enter into this there will be vein of course right they all like a content spinal nerve and artery spinal artery and spinal vein they will be also be content of intervertebral foramen i hope you've understood so and before i uh, rub this slide there is important thing that i have to tell you that these spinal nerves there is less of space although uh, i think it has been it's stretchable here okay hold on if i'm writing it here this is like you know the cut section of this spinal segment so it's the dorsal nerve root which has this drg then you have is the ventral nerve root both of them were joining to form the spinal nerve this is the nerve trunk and soon it emerges it divides into dorsal primary ramus and a ventral primary ramus that is a portion of typical spinal nerve there's a complete lecture already uploaded in my playlist you can study the details about the spinal nerve and all vertebral canal everything is given in my playlist of neuroanatomy you can search go through that now when it emerges like anterior primary rami very important is that anterior primary rami to the anterior primary rami there is another ganglion attached here with the help of two roots now this ganglion is this ganglion is sympathetic ganglion sympathetic ganglion this is a sympathetic ganglion and what was this drg drg was a sensory ganglion so drg was a content of intervertebral canal and here you have nerve roots right so remember that the distal nerve root is the white rami communicantis and the proximal one is the gray rami communicantis so this actually white rami communicantis is the distal this is 
distal this is distal and proximal one will be the great ami communicantis from where actually it's the pre ganglionic sympathetic fibers which enter the ganglia that will be through the white ami communicantis which is distally placed and the uh, post ganglionic sympathetic fibers will come out through this ganglion why this great ami communicantis they will be unmyelinated that's why this is called as great ami communicantis i hope you understood lot many more in points in this description so the answer here you know answer here intervertebral foramen contains all except i think it's easy now sympathetic ganglia will be the answer okay next question is arachnoid villi drain into which of the following sinuses arachnoid villi drain into which of the following sinuses it's a easy question although so look here now actually arachnoid villi in granulations basically when you see a cut section of a skull the, the uh, you know interior of the cranial vault you will find here in the midline you know this is the sagittal suture when you see it from inside right and if you're talking it is about the posterior end you'll find here the lambda here will be the brag you know you know this is the coronoid suture this is the lambdoid suture this is the sagittal suture right this is bragma this is lambda and everything you know and there will be two parietal foramen right and an obelion remember the point here in between anyway so what will you find in extra about from uh, apart from this you will find small small foveoli right surrounding to this sagittal suture on the inside of the cranial vault and these are like like depressions in the inner table of the vault so these depressions are because of like you know the granular fovea so and you know if you take a cut section like this is the outer table this is the inner table of the uh, you know cranial vault and here you find is this the meningeal layer of the dura mater and so the endosteal layer of the dura mater this is the meningeal layer of the dura mater and this on outside is the pericranium so what happens is like you know here you have is this arachnoid mater and this arachnoid matter gives out these arachnoid villi and granulations so these villi when they become mature they become tufted with the pedicles and that is why these are called arachnoid granulations and these are arachnoid villi so and you know this is sub arachnoid space and there is this trabecular layer of this arachnoid matter this is trabeculation it's a spongy type of thing and this is filled with csf you find is csf here and deep to that there will be you know this cerebral cortex there will be cerebral cortex with the gray and white matter the gray matter being in periphery the white matter deep inside and what else is there it's this pia matter this pia matter also has two layers you know ap pia and pia glia pia glia is one which is tethered and which reaches into the sulci and ap pia is which which provides a floor of anchorage to the cerebral vessels they will be cerebral vessels running here onto this surface so this is you know the cerebral vessels so this is hold on this is all including this this is all trabeculated space and it is all filled with csf now because i have drawn this diagram let me cover a few more mcqs which you know is about when you talk about this uh, emission you know this is a diploi when diploi is actually one which has like you know inside the bone marrow here an outer table and an inner table so diploi has you know these veins 
you know there are this type of veins and which communicate either from the bone marrow to the veins of the scalp on outside these are the diploic veins which open on outside and there is most of the diploic veins which open on the inside and this you know is the sinus similarly between the meningeal and ostial layer of the dura mater there is this dural venous sinuses there are a lot many other dural venous sinuses here it is superior sagittal sinus although you have an inferior sagittal sinus here at the lower end of the fox cerebri this is the fox cerebri so these are dural veins and remember diploic veins there was an mcq once asked about the diploic veins that which diploic vein drains on the outside mostly the diploic veins they drain the basically the newly formed this is a rich site of hemopoiesis you know the bone, bone marrow and the flat bones so the newly formed cells are drained through this diploic veins into the dural venous circulation on the inside but the frontal diploic veins mostly they are draining on outside to this veins on the outside the, the facial skeleton mainly the supraophthalmic veins then uh, they also have like occipital diploic veins which also drain on the veins on the occipital plexus and outside but there they also drain into the occip you know, ox you know, occipital uh, sinuses or the transverse sinuses on the inside but if this asks like which diploic veins drain on outside remember the frontal diploic veins they drain on the outside then again there is another mcq about this vein now what veins are these now remember if a vein traverses both the outer and inner table then this is called an emissary vein emissary vein now what about emissary vein there was a recently a question asked like i don't remember in which exam emissary vein first of all the emissary vein has to counterbalance the increase in intracranial pressure right so they are communicating the dural venous sinuses outside to the veins of the skull so there was a question asked like that emissary veins open into which layer of the skull so here also don't remember one two three four five s c a l p right fourth layer you must be knowing that is the dangerous layer of the skull because of the loose areolar connective tissue there right but that's not the answer answer will be that the emissary veins will drain into the second layer that is you know the connective tissue you know the superficial fascia that is below to the skin of the skull okay so the loose connect the connective tissue below the skin subdermal connected tissue or the hypodermis they will drain there that because you know uh, superficial fascia everywhere is the neurovascular layer so uh, emissary veins communicates the veins of the scalp in the second layer so i think i have covered the most of the relevant questions that was related to this and because of this granulations like you know the granulations there will be depression here and one more thing related to the cranial vault there are two tables you have an outer table outer table and an inner table which table like you know there are sutures so table these sutures start obliterating with age which suture obliterate first with age the the sutures on the inside of the cranial vault or the sutures on the outside of the cranial vault which ossify or obliterate first remember that the sutures on the inside of the cranial vault start obliterating first and that is around the third decade third decade may third decade of life may the sutures on the inside of the cranial vault they start ossifying and the sutures on the outer surface of the or the outer table of the cranial wall they start ossifying in the fourth decade of life right so it will be the inner sutures which will start ossifying obliterating first then one more thing have you seen that on the inside of the cranial wall there are some you know these marks streaks like this what are these streak marks on the inside of the cranial wall of course you must be guessing that it is the meningeal vessels but what actually these these uh, you know streaks on the inside of the table are because of meningeal artery or meningeal vein so remember it's basically meningeal veins meningeal 
meningeal veins and arteries of course both of them will lay an impression on the inner table of the cranial vault but meningeal veins actually it is the answer remember uh, not the arteries the meningeal veins actually arteries are actually more pressing upon the dura mater and veins are more peripheral or you can say more pressing upon the table or uh, inner table so these marks are mainly because of the meningeal veins so covered most of them i hope you don't know the answer i cannot will lie drain into which of the following sinuses of course the answer here that i've drawn here is the superior sagittal sinus this is the answer and here also you have is the answer superior sagittal sinus is the answer okay done question number 14 regarding lymph nodes thumb is drained in each uh, initial initially to the important question is regarding lymph nodes of the thumb so again now let's be fast to cover up this lymphatic drainage of the upper limb So, uh, let's see, this is the clavicle. Okay. Regarding lymphatic drainage, it's easy to remember that the lymph from this thumb and its web, this area, thumb and its web, Lymphatics actually, I should use a different color actually. This is the region, thumb and its web, you can write it. Thumb and its web. Web means, web means the space between the index and the thumb. This area, the lymphatic drainage actually, uh, you know, there is the cephalic vein like con you know continuation of the medial margin little marginal vein with the little end of the dorsal vein as arch like that starts in the anatomic lesson of box in the root of the anatomic lesson of that's a cephalic vein the cephalic vein you know that has this course that runs along the little part of the uh, the pre axial border of this forearm then you know it reaches in the cuboidal roof the cuboidal fossa and then it runs along the lateral border of this biceps brachii then it runs on the medial border of the deltoid or you can say uh, you know medial border of the deltoid and there it runs into the deltopectoral groove and ultimately when it dips inside there in the infraclavicular fossa dip deep side inside there will be you know this membrane here and that you know that have been taught to you uh, that is clavipectoral fascia so this cephalic vein is actually going to pierce this clavipectoral fascia and will ultimately drain here into the okay so it will drain into this lymph node here in the axilla below the clavicle and this is called infra sorry this is what i was telling about the cephalic vein sorry so cephalic vein is going to drain into the axillary vein now which part of axillary vein so remember it will be the first part of axillary vein cephalic vein drains into the first part of axillary vein now talking about the lymphatic drainage so from the thumb and its web the lymphatic drainage accompanies the lymphatics along uh, company along this cephalic vein so they are subcutaneous throughout their extent like cephalic vein is subcutaneous throughout its extent similarly will be the lymphatics from the thumb and its web they will accompany the same course and will also pierce remember they will also pierce the clavipectoral fascia and now they will drain into these lymph nodes here present below the clavicle and these are infra clavicular group of lymph nodes and these are also called or cephalic or cephalic lymph nodes so remember that the 
lymphatic drainage of the thumb is into the infraclavicular or cephalic group of lymph nodes, while the rest of the complete uh, upper limb drains into rest of the complete upper limb drains into the there will be lymph nodes here and you know from the medial side medial side the lymphatics actually drain here into cubital lymph nodes they might be the primary lymph node for so the medial side of the forearm so this is cubital or like they have mentioned supratrochlear they can be trochlear supratrochlear cubital these are the midway like primary lymph nodes and then they further continue up and ultimately the entire lymph from the upper limb drains into the lateral group of axillary lymph nodes so the lymphatics on the upper limb is completely drained into the lateral group of axillary lymph nodes while they have an intermediate lymph node on the medial border the lymphatic on the medial border of the forearm and the middle of the hand that drains into the cubital group of lymph nodes or the supratrochlear group of lymph nodes while from the thumb and its web all of the lymphatics they drain continuously along the cephalic vein and they drain into the after piercing the clavipetal fascia they will drain into the infraclavicular group of lymph nodes also called as cephalic lymph nodes i hope it understood now so the answer is infraclavicular nodes regarding lymph node from the thumb drain into the infraclavicular nodes okay they actually bypass the axillary group of lymph nodes so we've done with question number 14 now i'll talk about question number 15 nasolacrimal duct opens into nasolacrimal duct you have lacrimal sac lacrimal glands deep part is a wider part bigger part superficial is smaller and then they drains into the congen you know, congenital furnaces ultimately you have this lacrimal punctum that lacrimal canaliculi they join and they, they form here a sac lacrimal sac and then there's a nasolacrimal duct everything you know that you know so where actually is draining into you know that it drains into you like uh, you know this is the inferior concha this is the middle concha this is the superior concha of the nose right so you can remember that this nasal septum here so <clears throat> it is opening here in the this area this portion has a valve remember and at its opening and this is called a valve of hasner valve of hasner so the nasal lacrimal duct actually drains into the anterior portion of inferior meatus inferior meatus of nose Okay, anterior part of the inferior meatus is the right answer. Nasal lacrimal duct drains into the anterior part of inferior meatus, and at its opening, it has this valve that is valve of Hasner. So, fifteen answer is A. Question number sixteen: Facial artery is a branch of. Important question here. You must be, uh, you know, this is external carotid artery, internal carotid artery, ma maxillary artery, superficial temporal artery. I think everybody knows the answer. It's very easy question that external carotid is the uh, answer, right? Now, talking about the branches, fast revision about this. Let's say we are drawing is the external carotid artery, right? So, this is external carotid artery and, you know, the terminally divides into its two terminal branches, okay? Okay, so where it actually is like, you know, you have a carotid sinus, carotid body, and this is common carotid, and this is common carotid artery, this is um, internal carotid artery, and we're talking is about this is external carotid artery. Now, let's focus on the branches. Like one important MCQ is the first branch of external carotid artery. First branch, first branch of external carotid artery is it has been asked many times so remember that is superior thyroidal artery this is this has already been asked sometimes 
first branch of external carotid artery is superior thyroid artery so where it will be fine you find it's arising superior thyroid artery remember then you have is the lingual artery then you have is the facial artery and all this you can remember is related to this cornua of the higher bone the greater cornua lesser cornua is somewhere here. so it's related to the greater cornua greater cornua of hyoid so now where actually let's say this is superior thyroidal artery right then you have is the lingual artery and then you have is the facial artery so superior thyroidal artery i have already told you one point that it is the first branch of external carotid artery where does it arises remember superior thyroidal arise superior thyroidal artery arises opposite to the lower and or before to the uh, uh, you can say lower to this greater corner of the hyoid okay at the below to the greater corner of the hyoid then about lacrimal artery remember that it arises at the level it arises at the level of the greater corner of hyoid about facial artery remember the statement is that it rises above to the greater corner of the hyoid so these are three important lo location points then of course lingual artery this part of it is the first part is tortuous facial artery the first part is tortuous of course then about the posterior branches the two posterior branches remember this also is an mcq that which artery arises at the level of facial artery first of all remember superior thyroid lingual and facial all of them are anterior branches that's why i've shown you in a cut section those three these three are branches on the anterior portion of external carotid what arises from the posterior portion of the external posterior branch is actually two in number so remember this branch which is arising at the level of facial artery it might be an mcq in itself that which arise which artery arises from the external carotid at the level of facial artery this artery is occipital artery so remember occipital artery arises from the posterior surface of the external carotid artery at the same level of facial artery let me see we take a section you will find anteriorly it's facial artery posteriorly it is occipital artery then there is a muscle here there is a muscle here and this muscle is posterior belly of digastric so this is posterior belly uh, belly of digastric right so the another landmark for this artery that is arising posteriorly is this artery so which artery will be this this will be posterior auricular posterior auricular artery so posterior auricular artery is also a branch on the posterior surface of the external carotid and it arises above or upper at the level of upper border of posterior belly of digastric and now about these two terminal branches these two terminal branches are actually arising behind to the neck of mandible there is this neck of mandible <coughs> so remember and they are under to the cover of if they ask like there is a gland here this gland here is parotid gland so these two terminal branches and you know the names are maxillary artery maxillary artery and superficial temporal artery so both these branches arise behind the neck of mandible and under the cover of parotid gland right so this is parotid gland one artery is missed and that is the medial branch but remember it might become confusing some authors have written that this uh, ascending pharyngeal artery is posterior branch some say it is a medial branch so for you to remember and it arises from the proximal portion so remember that the better word for this this is which artery is this ascending pharyngeal artery ascending pharyngeal artery ke bare mein the important point is first of all it's a small branch it is arising from the proximal portion of external carotid but don't confuse the first branch first branch will be say superior thyroidal artery so this is ascending pharyngeal artery and ascending pharyngeal artery is 
posteromedial posteromedial so you remember this posteromedial because some authors write it as it as the posterior branch some authors write it as medial but but most oftenly if it there is an option to select between posterior medial you will select that it is the medial branch <coughs> okay so those are the important tips about the external carotid artery i have covered them all if you may not be able to read what i have written always try to focus what i'm speaking so keep listening okay so this question number 16 answer is a external carotid artery facial artery is the branch of external carotid which part of vertebral artery lies in the suboccipital triangle okay this although is an easy one you have this subclavian the first part of the subclavian gets this artery vertebral artery thyrocervical trunk and internal thoracic artery so we are talking about this first artery this first artery is, you know this vertebral artery this has this course from the opposite side also it will come like this like this so oh shit this is <coughs> thyrocervical vertebral and internal carotid this is subclavian right okay so this is vertebral artery first part second part third part fourth part and like this so the first part is first part is this and you can remember that this is the foramen transversarium and there is this vertebra behind so this is the seventh transverse process this is the sixth transverse process. <coughs> and let's say this is the transverse process of the first vertebra c1 so c6 to c1 that is the portion of second part of the vertebral artery so first part is this first part is from its commencement to commencement of the artery to transverse process of c6 so that means the first part does not passes through the foramen transversarium of the seventh cervical now about this third part the third part you are seeing is this part this portion of this artery is the third part which is a content of suboccipital triangle third part it emerges from the atlas then uh, you know winds behind and this arches over this you know this uh, atlas and then passes through the lower border of uh, you know posterior atlanto occipital membrane and then it becomes intracranial so the intracranial portion this portion here is the fourth part <coughs> remember the you know the tortuous artery within the cranium that is posterior inferior cerebellar artery yes posterior inferior cerebellar artery is a branch of fourth part of vertebral artery and that is a tortuous artery within the cranium so fourth part is this intracranial right this is intracranial part and the third part is through the suboccipital triangle this is through the suboccipital triangle so it is done which part of the artery the sub passes through the you know everything is been done the answer is the third third part so which of the vertebral artery passes the sub occipital triangle sub occipital triangle the answer will be third part it's correct question number 18 in adult male length of auditory tube in millimeters now this is also very important question keep focusing here this you seeing is a middle ear right so this is a middle ear and on the lateral wall of the little middle ear of course like you know tympanic membrane and all i'm just trying to focus here is about the external auditory meatus and here you have is the pinna which have the pinna 
and on the anterior wall remember on the anterior wall of this middle ear there is this tube reaching and this tube is called the auditory tube this is middle ear anterior wall there is an opening for this auditory tube right pharyngotympanic tube auditory tube and you know it develops from the first pharyngeal pouch including a part of second pharyngeal pouch so uh, you know this is external auditory this is external auditory meatus and this is auditory tube auditory tube is also called eustachian eustachian tube now the measurements are very important here so remember that this uh, this has like this let's divide it like this so the external ear the outer portion is cartilaginous inner portion is bony similarly here sorry there's some some something to be changed here this auditory tube right this auditory tube the portion the prox the you can say the portion attached to the middle ear the proximal portion or the deeper portion or deeper one third is bony and the peripheral or the outer portion outer two third is cartilaginous so cartilaginous is two third and bony is one third in case of auditory tube right now in case of external auditory meatus in case of external auditory meatus the inner the deeper portion is two third so this portion is two third two third and the peripheral is one third and the deeper portion is bony and the peripheral portion is cartilaginous so have you noticed the difference that in auditory tube the wider portion is cartilaginous that is towards the periphery central portion is bony which is one third and external auditory meatus the central portion is bony and it is longer it is two third while the cartilaginous portion is peripheral and one third okay now about the measurements so remember that external auditory meters is you know 24 millimeters very important so 24 millimeter if you divide into three it will become 16 millimeter is the bony portion and outer 8 millimeter is the cartilaginous portion in external auditory meatus and regarding this auditory tube the answer is remember it is 36 millimeters so now if you divide into 3 you will find that the bony so this auditory tube is 36 millimeters so this bony portion which is central this will be 12 millimeter and the outer portion will be 24 millimeter which is cartilaginous the peripheral portion so remember these dimensions i have made it easy for you to remember because they are divisible by three so it makes you convenient to remember two third and one third two third bony is uh, towards the external ear and uh, you know one third bony is towards the auditory tube so these are the answer remember 24 millimeters for external auditory meters 8 cartilaginous 16 bony bony is central 
and auditory tube 36 overall millimeter is the length and bony portion central is 12 and peripheral cartilage is 24 millimeter so you've got the answer so in adult male the length of auditory tube in male will be 36 millimeter is the answer now question number 19 is which cranial nerve lies in the junction between pons and medulla so it's easy you know between pons and medulla the cranial nerve which arises is between pons and medulla the nerves arising are nerves arising are easy eh? sixth seventh and eighth six seventh and eighth so the answer six seven and eight i think it's eight six seven and eight so the answer here will be sixth cranial nerve abducent nerve <sighs> okay then brain stem does not includes the brain stem does not includes the now look here actually you know you have these two the cerebral hemispheres cerebellar hemispheres and you have a diencephalon in between and the diencephalon posteriorly continues as the midbrain then you have is the pons and then you have is the medulla and continues down as the spinal cord right and the cavity here of the cerebral hemispheres is the lateral ventricle the two lateral ventricles they join here to form the cavity of the diencephalon is the third ventricle which continues as the cerebral aqueduct and then dilates to form the cavity of the hindbrain called the fourth ventricle which continues as the central canal of spinal cord so the parts of the cerebrum i mean in the cns is the four brain four brain now four brain is also called as prosencephalon prosencephalon then you have is the midbrain 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 is also called as mesencephalon mesencephalon and then you have is the hindbrain then hindbrain is called the actually hindbrain is not including the spinal cord it is the pons medulla and the cerebellum so i haven't drawn you can add the two cerebellum cerebellar hemispheres also here so this portion here the hindbrain hindbrain is called rhombencephalon rhombencephalon right now the prosencephalon has further two parts the telencephalon telencephalon includes cerebellum right bellum cerebellum and the diencephalon includes thalamus and subthalamus metathalamus epithalamus hypothalamus everything around so that is diencephalon and you have then 
is the midbrain midbrain is mesencephalon then hind brain actually includes three portion hind brain includes you know pons medulla and cerebellum okay so pons and cerebellum actually i should write it like this pons and cerebellum and then you have is the medulla the pons and cerebellum they are called meten cephalon and my uh, medulla is called myelin cephalon myelin cephalon okay now about the ventricular system the cavity of telen cephalon is lateral ventricle cavity of diencephalon is third ventricle cavity of midbrain is cerebral aqueduct cavity of hind brain is fourth ventricle fourth ventricle cavity of spinal cord is called central canal although you have a dilatation here at the lower portion also in the conus medullaris that is called the terminal ventricle or the you know uh, you know the dilatation there in the conus and between the septum pellucidum here sometimes yahan pe you know between the two septs, uh, you know um, the cavity of the third ventricle where you have this you know from the inferior surface of the corpus callosum and there is you know septum pellucidum between the two septum pellucidum there is cavity which is also called as sometimes as the fifth ventricle got it so that was all about this the brain stem does not include the so the brain stem actually is what what is brain stem brain stem is mid brain pons mid brain pons and medulla mid brain pons and medulla got it so that is called as a brain stem cerebral hemispheres these are attached with cerebral peduncles so those are the part of mid brain and you have pons and then you have is medulla right and posteriorly you have is the cerebellum and then it continues the spinal cord so this portion here you are seeing the midbrain pons and medulla midbrain pons and medulla these three are together called as brain stem right so i hope you understood now that the diencephalon is not a part of brain stem so i think it is done all 20 questions have been done so good luck for you